Hello and welcome to another Piper Pearl. Today's Pearl we're going to look at the dysuria consultation also known as painful urination. Now whilst this can be quite a detailed and complex topic today we're going to focus more on a single line that is more likely to present at a primary healthcare clinic or on, on first presentation. So you just keep in mind that as we're going through today, we are going to focus solely on what is more probable as opposed to all the options that are out there. So getting right into it, I'll explain further with the two definitions or two types of dysuria. So the main causes can be broken down into infectious and non-infectious. Today we're going to focus on the infectious one because they generally line up with what's also been called the uncomplicated urinary tract infections. And when you move into complicated urinary tract infections or complicated dysuria, then you're dealing with people with a large list of comorbidity and generally structural problems or obstructions, cancerous growth, things like that that cause dysuria. So the most common by far is the infectious. When you're looking at the difference between males and females, UTIs and infectious dysuria is more common in females, especially females between the ages of 15 and 44, which lines up pretty well with our demographic. The leading cause of this is bacterial cystitis and then vaginitis. Bacterial cystitis is a lot easier to obtain in females compared to males because of the shortened urethral tract to the bladder. Now, on top of all this, infectious dysuria can also and is also commonly caused by STIs. So STIs will be wrapped up into this consultation because it is quite a probable cause. STIs are excessively common, far more common than people think, and they are chronically under-recognized. A massive study was done across many, many continents, and it was found that about a million new cases of curable STIs were contracted each day across the world. And when I say curable, I mean your syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and schistomyces. They were the main four that were most prevalent. And up to 50% of all these cases were actually asymptomatic, meaning they were passing it on to people and waiting for a case of susceptibility, which we'll discuss, before it would become dysuria or an actual problem. Other statistics associated with STIs is things like syphilis that was on a massive decline is actually starting to increase in the last five years. And special cases of gonorrhea that are resistant to antibiotics are becoming more prevalent in certain areas of Australia. So as we talk today with consultation, we will discuss things associated with STIs, but just realize that pretty much anything to do with STIs will have to involve some sort of referral because it comes with other commitments in contact tra tracing, things like that. Now on the other end of the spectrum, UDIs are excessively uncommon in men that are circumcised. Uncircumcised men have the risk associated with bacteria and growth forming underneath the foreskin and if they don't keep that area clean, and they can be susceptible to UTIs, whereas circumcised men, there's nothing housing the actual bacteria in place. So it is very, very uncommon for them to get UTIs, meaning if they present with dysuria, it is more likely something else. Now across the whole board, dysuria, uncomplicated, complicated, infectious, non-infection, accounts for about 3% of cases of people over the age of 40 at any one time. Okay, so it's relatively common but not ridiculously compared to other topics that we have discussed. In our demographic it will mostly be the infectious, STI and UTI related. So just to help increase our understanding we'll have a bit of a look at pathophysiology of the actual pain and then the pathophysiological process of the common bacterial process. So dysuria typically occurs when urine comes in contact with inflamed or irritated urethral mucor lining. This is exacerbated 
by the association with the dentura muscle contraction. So as it contracts, it increases the pressure, which can increase the pain itself. And that stimulates the submucosal pain at the sensory reception, resulting in pain. Now this pain can be itchiness, burning sensation on urination. You can also get pain around urination as well, after voiding, pre-voiding, things like that. Now, various inflammatory and neuropathic processes can increase the sensitivity of these receptors. Occasionally, uh, inflammation from surrounding organs like the colon can actually result in dysuria as well. When we're dealing with the non-infectious types, just to mention them, we're talking about urinary calculi, tumors, trauma, structural foreign bodies, uh, and basically the malformation of genitals. Now, this can result in irritation of the urethra and the bladder mucosa, and decreasing the capacity and elasticity of that dentrusa muscle, which can increase the urgency and incontinence, which makes it more probable to get that irritation. When we focus on more on the infectious side, then we move into that realm of uncomplicated UTIs, which usually solely involve the bladder, especially when we're dealing with females. So most organisms causing a UTI are a special type of bacteria called a coliform, and they typically inhibit the area surrounding the vagina naturally. Now these organisms will ascend the urethra into the bladder and when they invade the bladder they invade the mucor wall resulting in inflammation and this is obviously called cystitis. Sexual intercourse is a common cause of UTIs so whilst it's obviously a common cause for STIs the actual intercourse itself will drive that bacteria up closer to the bladder and result in UTIs as well. Now, luckily for us, urine itself is naturally antimicrobial because it has certain factors that are unfavorable to bacterial growth, like it's low pH, generally less than five, it has high urea level, it's hyperosmolarity, and its presence of organic acids, proteins, and nitrates basically means that the bacterial growth isn't actually able to happen because it's inhibited by urinary proteins. So frequent urination and high volumes of urination actually decrease the risk of UTIs. The bladder wall lining is covered with this layer of mucus which acts as an actual mechanical barrier for the bacterial infiltration and invasion. So any defect or injury of this mucosal layer is considered a predisposing factor for UTIs and obviously reoccurring infections. The bacteria that causes UTIs unfortunately tend to have an adhesive ability to the surface which allows the organism to attach to this mucosal surface and then develop mechanisms to survive that hyperosmotic environments. And in many cases, like when we're dealing with peptic ulcers, it has the ability to break down the urea into alkaline ammonia and increase the urinary pH, so making it less acidic, therefore making it more favorable to bacteria. In addition, the short urethra found in females allows for an easy transfer of these bacterial from the urethra into the bladder, causing cystitis. Now, the presence of bacteria in urine does not denote an infection. It's only certain pathogenic bacteria that have the ability to bind to the mucor lining, changing the environment of the actual bladder that causes cystitis, are the ones that denote an infection. And the difference between a UTI and an SDI in males it's pretty much indistinguishable because it both affects the urinary and the sexual organ, which is the same thing. But in females, a UTI is an infection of the urethra and an STI is the infection of the vagina that can lead to uh, the urethra as well. So let's move on to our consultation. 
The main thing we really need to knuckle down is we need the patient to explain to us what dysuria is in their mind. So when they came to you something saying that they've got pain on urination, we need to know exactly when that pain occurs and how it feels. So is it during voiding? Is it right at the start? Is it a burning sensation? Is it an itching sensation? And how long does it last? Is it only present during urination and then it ceases to exist or is it present after or preceding urination as well we also want to know any other symptoms that the patient may have this can be painful groin pain in the peritoneal area pain in the scrotum anything like that we need to know all the associated symptoms the person complains of a fever that obviously ups the ante of what we're dealing with which we can discuss later on when you're dealing with UTIs slash STIs, it is all about the person's history. And we need to get a little bit personal with the patient and we need to really figure out their associated risk factors and probability of them having an infectious cause of dysuria. So we start with all the P's as far as past history goes. And we want to know about past cases of STIs, urine, UTIs and urinary disorders. STIs because a lot of them can be dormant. So if you've had an STI, it can lead to increased probability of more STIs due to your lifestyle. Okay? Not obviously a guarantee, but it can happen. In the case of UTIs and urinary disorders, as we just spoke about with pathophysiology, if you have a predisposing factor weakening that mucor lining, then you're more likely to be more susceptible to cystitis. So having a history of that, really helps us understand uh, certain risk factors. When looking at STIs, we need to know how many partners you've had. Okay? Nice, easy question. Usually give it in a ballpark figure in the last month, three months, depending on the situation, but we want to know partners and frequency. You need to know practices because certain practices, any anal sex versus vaginal sex, has an inherent risk associated with it when dealing with STIs. You need to know any form of prevention methods for pregnancy that the person may be taking or the partnership may be taking. And we also need to know if protection is being used, whether it's female condom, male condoms, that sort of thing. Because anything that is not protecting from STIs is obviously an inherent risk. Okay, There are people out there that will consider being on the pill as a prevention of pregnancy as a sufficient means of protection but unfortunately obviously it's it's not so we need to understand this if we were dealing with females for the last three this information that we need to understand in order to build a full picture we need to know the possibility of pregnancy and if there is a possibility then we need to do a pregnancy test a ectopic pregnancies things like that can also cause dysuria so we want to make sure in the case that it is an infectious uti that the person is not pregnant if they are pregnant it alters the treatment regime as well with the possibility of pregnancy we can also ask the female if there's pain associated with intercourse because that leads us more down the line of vaginitis as opposed to cystitis we'd like to know the person's fertility plans and associated uh, risks, which includes any past history of pelvic inflammatory disease. Unfortunately, pelvic inflammatory disease can be a result of STIs because basically the ovaries aren't connected to the fallopian tube. So as the infection moves up into the uterus through the fallopian tubes, it can then enter the pelvic region the abdominal region causing pelvic inflammatory disease and reoccurring cases of pelvic inflammatory disease are strongly linked to infertility to the point that if a person was to have three cases of PID they statistically become 66 percent less likely to ever have a child okay so we really need to keep that into account and if it has a risk of it or if it is an SDI we need to treat it early and identify it rapidly as well so don't dismiss early cases of STIs and if someone has a profile of 
considerable risk or even moderate risk, recommend that they do an SDI screen in case they are asymptomatic. With that, because it finishes the whole pain profile, uh, it's also good to have a general idea of the menstrual history. As mentioned, certain other organs around the area can have referred pain to dysuria. So if someone has a uterine or a menstrual type problem, it can manifest as an actual dysuria. And the last few points to finish up looking at past history is you can ask diet. Okay, diet is really only relevant if the person comes in saying that they have offensive or strong odor uh, with their urine. Obviously, we all know the asparagus, but also things like Brussels sprouts, fish, garlic, onion, certain spices can also have a manifestation on causing your urine to be quite foul and, and odorous. So if it's one of the associated symptoms, then you can ask about diet. Urinary trauma is also a good idea to ask, and this can be the case of males being kicked in the groin, sporting injuries, things like that. It can also cause structural defects or inflammation caused from trauma as opposed to inflammation caused from infection. Moving into subjective questioning, at this stage you want to know everything about the urine from the patient's perspective. You want to know how often they're going to the toilet. People with cystitis will tend to go to the toilet a lot more because the capacity of the bladder has been reduced due to inflammation. So they'll have the urge to go and they'll have less elasticity and ability to hold urine, so the frequency will increase. You want to know the colour. We definitely want to know if there's any blood, but we also want to know the general colour of the urine. Okay, if it's dark, brown, that sort of thing, then we need to start thinking systemic problems. If it's hypoosmotic, meaning really, really clear, despite how little the person may be drinking, then that can also lead us to things like early onset diabetes uh, and other systemic problems that are causing a diuretic effect for the person. We've already mentioned odour. We also want to know about any pus or mucus type discharge and obviously need to know about blood as well. Any discharge from the urethra builds the profile of STIs or certain UTIs and will obviously lead us to a certain line of treatment. Another thing you can ask people, and that may sound a little bit weird, but if you ask the person if they think they have a UTI, it actually has a high probability rate of being a urinary tract infection to the point that a major study was done on UTIs where they tested all the general things that we use, whether it's temperature, whether it's urinalysis, even a swab, and they also included uh, the thing known as patient's gestalt, which is a patient's feeling that they have a UTI. And that actually had the highest probability of success rate compared to any of those other tests. So just asking someone if they think they have a UTI can actually be more probable than a lot of the other tests out there. Just for an interest sake. Okay, so moving away from subjective questioning, allergies are purely there when we're doing medications. Okay, the main medication that is used in these particular cases is your Keflosporins. So we need to know if there's associated allergies because then we'll need a alternate choice. As far as medication goes, we need to know if they've already taken antibiotics. So if they've already been on antibiotics in the last month and they still have these infectious signs, then it can mean that it is a resistant strain, or it also could mean that they didn't take the antibiotics correctly and it's a reoccurrence or even a spike up of a bacteria. Another thing that it can be, is particularly in females, is the infectious can actually be caused by candidae, a fungus, as opposed to a bacteria. There's a homeostatic relationship, especially within the vaginal walls, between fungus and bacteria. The bacteria will feed on the fungus and keep them at bay, and most of the time not cause any problems. If you were to take antibiotics and clear out these bacteria, then there's really nothing stopping that fungal growth. So that can be a consideration. 
Ask them if they're on any vitamin supplements. Okay, that's mostly when people come in complaining of weird urine. It's the most common cause of your fluorescent urine. And you can also ask if they're already on natural therapies that are designed to alkalize the actual urine itself. Okay, so they're already on it and they've still got signs of this infectious case, then you're more likely to have a resistant strain of infection. We move away from subjective data into our objective investigations. We need to do vital signs, have to do vital signs, and we need to check the body for a rash. If someone has dysuria associated rash and fever, that's a systemic problem and needs to be taken into account, okay, because it's very difficult for urinary tract infections to get a temperature because of the protective layers. It means it has broken the mucosal layer, had contact with the blood, and therefore allowed pyrogens to be released to get a temperature. And the rash generally denotes a systemic infection. Okay, so always look out for that. Palpate the abdomen for masses of associated organs themselves, and feel the lymph glands uh, in the joints, sorry, the lymph glands in the groin, and feel for joint pain as well, also indicative of a systemic infection. Urinalysis is a must, okay? It's not used to diagnose a UTI solely, uh, but a urinalysis can be very, very useful. So when you're taking a urinalysis, you want to visually inspect it, and cloudy urine can be uh, just caused by natural proteins and calcium phosphates that's within the urine, or obviously it can be an infection. So it's not a guarantee just by looking at it, so we need to do a dipstick. Okay, the most helpful distic values diagnostically is our pH, our nitrates, leukocytes, and our blood. So a negative dipstick does not rule out a UTI, but a positive finding can be highly suggestive of diagnosis. When you're dealing with pH, a normal pH is slightly acidic. With values usually around the 5.5 up to the 7. Normal range is anywhere between 4.5 and 8 though. So urine pH of 8.5 to 9 indicates a urea splitting organism. Okay, and that's one of those infectious ones. Alkaline urine the highly alkaline urine can also signify things like kidney stones. And you can also have something known as infectious stones as well. So you have a kidney stone and you have an infection over the top due to a high pH. Nitrite test is the most accurate distic test for a UTI because bacteria must be present in the urine to convert nitrates to nitrites. This process generally takes about six hours and is why urologists will often uh, request your your first morning urine. Okay, that's that's why, because overnight, the process of this transfer is taken, so if you did the first catch, then it's more likely to contain those high levels of nitrites. Leukocytes identify the presence of white blood cells in urine. The white blood cells release, obviously, the enzyme that is picked up on this, so it's not actually picking up the white blood cell, it's picking up the actual enzymes. Uh, this is presumably in response to bacteria in the urine. It can also occur for a whole bunch of other reasons, like inflammatory disorders, vaginal infections, so it's not very sensitive. So it's never taken as a standalone, okay? It's always taken into consideration. Most people think straight away that that is the main one to get but ph and nitrites are actually far more useful uh, in your urinalysis whereas hemiuria can be helpful in finding uh, bacteria infections can actually destroy the cell lining of the bladder which can create some bleeding this finding may help distinguish between uti versus vaginitis uh, which does not cause blood in the urine, obviously. So all those things can all build up to more likely a bacterial infection.
As far as inspecting the area goes, it's really a case by case base. Most of the time you don't have to, you can ask the patient. If you're dealing with a male and the male has lesions on the end of the gland, they're going to be able to tell you that. A female with vaginitis, granted, may may not know. Okay, but also you need to weigh up whether or not your visual inspection is warranted. And if it is, always ask about a chaperone. A lot of people assume that people want chaperone, but in some cases that can mean that the awkward situation has just received an audience. Okay, so don't mandate a chaperone. It is the patient's choice. And always weigh up whether or not you need to do these inspections as opposed to doing it because you think you have to. Okay, so just keep that in mind. As far as pathology goes, it's always... It's always a question. Uh, pathology is fantastic. Okay, we want to take urine away for an MCS. Swabs are great, and blood tests can also be really, really helpful as far as PCRs and full blood counts as well goes. Okay, so in regards to swabs, a lot of the old teaching will have you take the swab itself. And it always seemed really weird that it gave you detailed instructions of how to hold the penis and milk it in order to get pus and mucus out of the end of it instead of just going well why can't the patient do that themselves okay so a lot of modern teachings in particular the, uh, the PCCM now has encouraged the use of self-taking swabs uh, for females and males uh, which is just it's a lot more comfortable for the patients okay so if you do need swabs obviously get those if you're doing a urinalysis then why not send it away for an MCS? It's fantastic as far as getting the cultures that you need in order to make sure the bacteria is susceptible to the antibiotic that you are providing. And blood tests can be used uh, mostly for your systemic type problems, full blood counts, that sort of thing. Once we have all of our data, we need to break it all down and make an assessment of the situation. Now there are differences between males and female profiles. So when you're doing your assessment and you're thinking about males, we need to denote what the main problem was, or what the big problem was. So if we have discharge and they're sexually active, then we can start thinking UTI versus STI. Okay, remember that a UTI in a male is an STI by a different origin. If they have penile lesions, different line, scrotal pain versus peritoneal pain. Okay, so when we're dealing with penile discharge in a male, we automatically assume that it's an STI until proven otherwise, okay, because that comes with contract tracing. So we get a swab and we test it. Start them on antibiotics and, and we go from there. If we're dealing with penile lesions, then we can be dealing with your viruses like herpes, can be dealing with balanitis itself, which is inflammation of the actual foreskin. And you can be de dealing with syphilis, a bacterial infection that causes an ulcer on, on the end. Okay, I will be doing a separate lesson on male health in particular, talking a lot more about these particular conditions outside of dysuria. Scrotal pain can be indicative of a, epididymitis, which can also cause pain on urination. And then obviously we have our prostate to consider. So prostitis can obviously be a, co a cause of dysuria. And as a result, you generally get more pain associated with the peritoneal reason as opposed to pain on urination. It's usually pain prior to urination and the inability to finish as well. When we're doing our assessment on a female with dysuria, then we need to know if they have vaginal discharge. Okay, as I mentioned before, an STI in female is an infection of the vagina, whereas a UTI is obviously an infection of the urethra. So if they have a vaginal discharge as well, then we're dealing with our vaginitis, okay, most likely caused from sexually transmitted infections. If we don't, then we're dealing with a UTI. Okay, so that's pretty much the separation. With females, we can increase our caption 
and we can find out if they could have a similar thing to contact dermatitis of the actual vaginal area, especially if they've been using any irritants. And that comes under practices and things like that. So if someone has a rash and irritation in the area, it's obviously going to cause inflammation. And when they go to void, it's going to cause pain. Males versus females, that's the assessment. We need to know which line we're doing. And each one of these lines obviously lines up with a different type of treatment. And certain types of discharge profile also lines up with different antibiotics as well. Okay, once we have our probable diagnosis, because remember we won't actually have the diagnosis until swabs and pathology comes back, we can move on to our treatment. Education plays a big part in this and safe sex practices can be a huge topic. The topic can be so huge depending on the person's profile that sometimes it's worth referring them to a sexual health specialist instead of giving general advice yourself. Okay, so obviously talking about safe sex can be taboo, can be difficult, uh, especially if there's an age difference or a gender difference associated with the consultation. It, it can be difficult, okay? So just keep in mind that if you don't have rapport with the patient, giving any safe sex advice is going to be difficult, okay? But safe sex practices and the risks associated with STIs, in particular asymptomatic STIs, is pretty high. So even the encouragement of a sexually active person who's engaging in more than low risk activity associated with sex should be encouraged to have STI pathologies done in order to keep themselves and obviously the public safe. In cases of infectious or irritants, you can talk about hygiene. You can also talk about the importance of hydration and the fact that high frequency and high volumes of urine output reduces the risk of UTIs and can actually help treat UTIs as well. Moving on to more of our pharmaceutical lines of treatment. If someone has a irritation, then they can increase water and they can take gear or all those sorts of things uh, just, just to help with the pain. But if someone is infectious, then we start looking at uh, our antibiotics. So these are all based on consultation. You need permission to give the antibiotics. But if someone has a STI, then we start with keftriaxone, 500 grams stat. And then depending on what they have discharge from, we'll denote the other antibiotic that we give. So if they have anal discharge, which obviously can happen through certain practices, we give them doxycycline. If they have genital discharge, then we give them metronidazole and azithromycin, as well as the keftriaxone. So they get the trifecta for STI with genital discharge. Someone has PID, okay, so you have a female mostly and they have PID, then we start with keftriaxone and doxycycline for 14 days. If the person's pregnant or they're breastfeeding, then we drop the doxy and we give them azithromycin one gram every week. Okay, so that obviously means they need to be able to come back to get the next treatments as well. Continue on with treatment, if someone has a UTI, cystitis itself, and then we start moving down our trimethoprim line. If they're allergic to trimethoprim, then keflexin is obviously a good difference. Now in males, it's going to be difficult to tell the difference between STI and UTI, so basically work on the rule of discharge. If there's discharge, you treat it like an STI. If there isn't discharge, but they've got signs of a UTI and cystitis in the urinalysis, in the other findings, then you start treating with trimethoprim. Now, if it goes all the way up and you're starting to think that glomerulonephritis, which I understand we didn't really talk about today, then it's a different treatment of bacillin LA itself. Okay, now glomerulonephritis is generally a secondary infection from a skin or a throat infection that can be associated with dysuria purely because of the pain associated with the production of 
urine. Okay, so not a direct link, didn't really focus too much on it in this consultation, but it is different because it's caused mostly from a descending infection as opposed to an ascending infection. Restrictions, case by case. Okay, case by case. If the person is able to work still, then let them work. Okay, dysuria can be not too bad and pretty controlled depending on the environment. So always play it case by case. As far as referring them, okay, most cases of dysuria you're going to refer. Okay, because they need pathology. They need swabs in order to know what the bacteria is to know whether or not it's susceptible. So referral at least to pathology or, or follow-up is going to be done. If someone has STIs and you're in a field environment, then you cannot do contact tracing in the field. Okay, because it's not long enough. Depending on the organism, once it comes back, will denote how far back the contract tra tracing is that you need to do. So you can prepare the person that they're going to be asked a bunch of questions about their sexual partners and those sexual partners will come in for STI screens but in reality it's best to be done in a clinic who can be documented done properly so they will often get referred as well. Okay so that brings us to the end of dysuria. Granted mostly mixed up with our STIs just realize that they are excessively common, UTIs and STIs, or infectious causes of dysuria are common. They're quite a sensitive topic for people uh, to the point that they can almost be ignored. So bottom line for this one is just realize that people who are sexually active and choose to engage in higher risk sexual, sexual acts should be encouraged and educated on getting regular STI screens, even if they're asymptomatic. Okay, up to 50% of STIs, gonorrhea and chlamydia in particular, are asymptomatic and can be passed on to a more susceptible person or infect you, or the patient, I should say, situation of susceptibility and a lower immune system. But until next time, take care.